Hello and welcome back to Benji's Cafe Podcast with me, Ben Harlow. Thanks for listening, the kettle's on and joining me for a cup of this week is the choreographer and 2022 Mr Gay England, David Ord. David is co-founder and artistic director of the LGBTQ plus collective Homo Parody. He hosts Wake Up London on Riverside Radio and his performing credits include Disney's Beauty and the Beast and Starlight Express. As a choreographer, David has worked alongside Bruno Tonioli, Lee Proud and Arlene Phillips. He directed and co-choreographed the musical Moulin Rouge at the Waterman's Theatre London and in 2015, David choreographed the West End Bears in aid of Theatre Man Trust. David was voted Mr Gay England in 2022 and in 2023, Mr Gay Europe and Mr Gay World. Oh yes, and he was also the dance double for Gary Lineker in the Chris Bradford. He's one busy bee. Enjoy listening. Hi, David. Thank you for joining Hello. me in Benji's Cafe. What an introduction. I love it. Are you well? Yeah, I'm really good. Thank you. So good to see you. Thank you. You're so welcome. It's really good to see you. Let's go back mm-hmm. to 2010. I'm pretty sure it was. <laughs> yeah. When I first met you, David, um, you were a, a young pup then, um, and you joined <laughs> the cast of Disney's Beauty and the Beast. I'd I think it was my third, entering my third year of the tour. Yeah. But I think you started rehearsals with the new cast for the third year in the January. We were in a church hall somewhere in Chiswick, nice and dusty. I was probably in my size 12 jazz shoes. But I just <laughs> honestly want to say, and I still remember it, the joy and enthusiasm you brought to that cast, even oh. in the early stages of rehearsal. Um, have you always had that? join us about you like literally you you lit up the room and and you just graduated hadn't you yeah I I graduated in 2009 so that was I was lucky enough to go straight into the job and I was just so I I I don't know I was definitely that sort of keen bean energy when you've just graduated from college and everything's just really exciting um but yeah I was just really grateful for the opportunity to do it and um I was kind of blown away by everyone and how like because obviously people had done the show before um so I was just like I came into the space where everyone was just so good and I felt like generally the energy of the cast were was, was amazing we just had such a good time didn't we because it's tough isn't it on tour you know you're moving yeah. people think it's quite a glamorous existence but you you know you're not in hotels you're moving weekly you're traveling on a Sunday yeah. it's never planned is it It could be from Aberdeen down to Eastbourne and then back to <laughs> yeah. Inverness but it's yeah it's a tough existence and it's important to have a, a real kind of good sense of community within a company isn't it yeah absolutely um I was going through a bit of a difficult time as well with my mum and uh I had so many people that were just so supportive and everyone that was there actually just really everyone looked after each other and we became this like family unit when we were on the road it was great um yeah I just loved I loved it I mean I think Shrewsbury might have been, might be my highlight there was a lot in Shrewsbury. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, Prince Harry. <laughs> Prince Harry, yeah. Uh, me I'd rolling my ankle. I'd forgotten about that. <laughs> paintballing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Were you paintballing with Prince Harry? <laughs> I wasn't. Didn't you sit, so. weren't we out having a drink? In my drinking days, of course, my goodness. But weren't we out <laughs> having a drink after the show? Yeah, we went to some club and I was one of the early ones to get there. And Prince Harry was across the road eating a pizza, but I didn't actually know it was Prince Harry. I was just like, oh, look at those people eating pizza. So I went over there, asked for a slice of pizza and asked what what pizza it was. And they were like, oh, it's really spicy. You wouldn't want it. I was like, oh, no, I like spicy food. Go on. And then I was like, oh, you look like Prince Harry. (laughs) And all of them just (laughs) looked at me. Uh, it was at that point I kind of knew it was Prince Harry. They asked me to move on, and I was like, oh, okay, can I not have your pizza? <laughs> Did he not give you a royal slice? No, no royal slices. <laughs> oh, that was so funny. Oh, gosh, yeah. yeah. And you mentioned it was your, your first professional job, David. Mm. Was it a real eye-opener? Was it what you expected once you graduated, or was it completely different to how you imagined your first job would be? Um. I mean, so at college, I was called the like contemporary bod. So everyone thought I was going to go into like sort of Matthew Bourne or a contemporary company. Um, and I, I did some contemporary jobs later, but it was kind of when you're told that at college, you kind of 
you kind of put yourself in that box. Um, but when I auditioned for Beauty and the Beast and I got it, I, I've always loved musical theatre and that's what I kind of wanted to do. Um, but I feel like generally it was it was better than I expected. I think it actually was such a dream first job, um, a great company of people. And yeah, and also Martin, who runs UK Productions, is just so loyal, so kind, um, was supportive during everything with my mum and has been since. I still choreograph for UK Productions. So yeah, it was just, it set me up so well, I think. I completely echo yeah. that, Re Martin and UK Productions, David. A real loyal producer. He's always he'll always come and say hello before a show. He visits you in Panta. Just yeah, so supportive, and and it that's lovely to have that, isn't it? Especially the difficulties mm. you were having at home at the time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's just he's one in a million. He's so nice, and uh, yeah, I've been sort of helping with the choreography for UK productions, just auditioning dancers, all that kind of thing. And every time he's just so grateful, so kind of, um, it, it just makes you feel welcome in the room as well. And um, yeah, we love Martin. <laughs> you went from Beauty David um, onto Starlight Express, onto yeah. Ghost, amongst many other musicals. Mm. You're performing somebody else's um, choreography, somebody else's work almost at what point did you think oh gosh I'd like to have a crack at this it was that had mm. that always been there for you yeah for sure when I was a kid I was like making up <laughs> full-scale musicals in my living room for my family uh I was always the one that was like yeah choreographing and vi like I, whenever I hear a song that I like for example I will have this vision that I'll be like, ah, oh, I want to do something with this and I can just see it straight away. So I basically wanted to kind of tap into that a lot more. But from leaving college, I felt like I had to sort of earn my stripes as a dancer first, kind of get to know how that is. And yeah, I, I just got lucky with one opportunity to choreograph a show for a, um, for a dance school. And from that, I was able to get a bit more teaching experience as well and the two kind of go hand in hand like you kind of have to be a good choreographer and a good teacher I would say um, so with those two things sort of happening as I was performing and auditioning uh, for shows one sort of started to take over from the other mm. and then I was just yeah like I said I was lucky to get more and more choreography experience and it was kind of the pandemic where just before that, I'd sort of decided that Miss Saigon was going to be my last show and had a great time, but I was sort of done. Um, and then it was during the pandemic that I was like, right, I need to choreograph more and do things for myself, things that I have always felt like, felt like I wanted to do. And yeah. you mentioned when you hear a piece of music, you'd have that imagery mm. in yourself, in your own mind, David. Was that... And you mentioned the importance of being a good teacher as well. Was it quite hard initially to convey that imagery, what you wanted, the feel of the piece to to your dancers? Uh, it depends. I, there's some things that just happen so naturally and just seem to work. And I think that generally happens when you're really invested in what you're you're doing and what you know exactly what you want. Um, obviously, as a choreographer, you don't always get the opportunity to do what you want. Sometimes it's like, this is the show this is the music, you need to create something with this. Mm. So that's sometimes when it's a bit harder because maybe the visions aren't quite strong. I sound like a medium. <laughs> <laughs> You're the mystic Meg of the dance world. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Do you have immense pride when you see a piece of work on stage that you just kind of dreamt up yourself? It must be yeah. a wonderful feeling. It is amazing. It really is. And I think we don't celebrate our achievements enough, really, because as soon as you achieve something, you think, oh, I need to do something else or what's the next mm. thing? Um, and there has been times where I've been really sort of critical on myself and something would I'd watch something that everyone else was saying, oh, this is amazing. It's so good. But I'd be still sweating the small stuff and like, yeah. oh, yeah, but that person did that. And, you know, um, and I think that's one of the main things I've learned over the time of being a choreographer is, is not to be too sort of precious with your work. Sort of like, you know, it, it's not 
it's not rocket science it's not life or death it's not you know the jeopardy isn't that high it's literally like a people dancing on stage for entertainment purposes so as soon as you start to like surrender all of that um i've had some real proud moments for sure um but i think the more personal of it yeah. as well um i mean when, when i first choreographed up in sunderland at the empire for panto uh the whole time i was kind of in this <laughs> in this tiny dance school down the road um with like one heater to this massive room <laughs> and <laughs> was creating all this stuff and I was a bit like oh my god what is happening as soon as we got in the theater and I saw the dancers on the on the stage this was like during tech and everything I got these like goosebump moments where I was like oh my god this is this is big um and I always, I'm a, I'm a crier anyway, but I always cry mm. at Panto when I see like all the kids laughing and reacting and cheering to uh, what we've created. It's it's so special. I love that. It is lovely, isn't it? And it is easy to forget when you're in the midst of a dusty rehearsal room to forget <laughs> the joy that your yeah. work is bringing to, especially in pantomime, all generations. My first musical I saw was Oliver at the Palladium. And that's always had this like special place in my heart. I think it's actually coming back, which is which is fab. Uh, but yeah, I, I don't know. It's just my family knew that. Well, they always say they broke the mold when they made me. <laughs> but <laughs> I just knew what I wanted like my whole life. I was just like I knew what it was going to be. Uh, there was never any sort of decision being made. I was just like, this is what I'm doing. Um, and yeah, I've got sort of early theatre memories to, th I guess, thank for sparking all that off. It's very easy to, to sweat over the small things creatively mm. and also in life. And isn't it a wonderful moment, which I think you, you may have found yourself, I certainly have through being sober, is that just the moment when there's almost like an anchor goes in your soul where mm. you're just happy to be doing what you love and to be making a difference. With Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think... That's what I've found in the in the last few years, especially is just kind of uh, doing something that is making a difference just means the world to me. Um, I think it's so special for sure. And yeah, I the more I do, the more I think oh, that needs doing. I need to do more of that. And yeah, it's it's really special. Well, yeah. from meeting you in that rehearsal room, David, to seeing what you've achieved professionally and in the lgbtq plus community is so admirable i nearly oh, swore then but i'm trying to keep this you know sort of quite <laughs> quite family-esque but yeah it's it's wonderful and thank you where does that drive come from have you always wanted to like be a guiding light if we can just start with mr gay england and how your passion is helping people i think it's yeah. so admirable david oh thank you um, the two kind of homo parody and Mr. Gay kind of go hand in hand. So from the pandemic, I decided that I wanted to start freeing up what I did and what I put out there because before my agent would sort of be quite restrictive in what I could put out and I wouldn't do anything that was kind of LGBT related. Uh, I was I, I grew up as a dancer that was told to dance like a man mm. um, at college. We were kind of, that was really instilled in us. Um, so it was it was actually only in, when I did Starlight Express, I um, covered Perse and Perse is like not necessarily his sexuality or gender isn't really defined, but it's very flamboyant. And the sort of the way he ticks over is very kind of like expressive, I guess. Yeah. As soon as I went on for that part, it was the first time I felt I was able to dance in a sort of different way in a kind of like sort of. Uh, I guess gender non-specific kind of way yeah. and it felt so freeing and liberating so did you feel that from... instantly like instantly yeah. you felt that wow. yeah I, honestly and I mean the the people that were watching like the the director the choreographer and all that they were just they were so complimentary afterwards they just were saying how amazing that that looked and how it, they didn't expect me to be doing that because I do look rolling stock and I love it and I love yeah, doing yeah. That, that kind of thing um so that's kind of that's where this has all 
started because then when I started homo parody I was doing things that gave me that same freedom and that same way of like expressing myself and the more I did of that which is basically like we, we recreate music videos we parody things we I, I'll be gaga or whatever yeah and we we copy the music videos and we perform them at prides and we do we make the actual videos themselves well i looked um, at the um yeah. your show the show reel yesterday and talk about putting a smile <laughs> on your face it's fantastic and then of course trafalgar square on the main stage yeah. it's it's infectious the yeah the, jo the joy that you have performing thank you yeah I and mean, that's that's exactly what it is i wanted to that feeling that i got from doing purse and then doing the homo parodies i just wanted to give that to other people and dance is, I mean, it really is healing, dancing, and it can help so many people to combat loneliness and feelings of detachment, all that kind of thing. As long as you take out the sort of competitive nature of dance, which is obviously instilled in professionals from like, from the get go, yeah. as soon as you take that element out, and realize no one in the room's competing everyone's just doing it as a collective to to enjoy it and just have some fun then there's like a real power in it and that's what i i just love seeing other people get that feeling from from dancing so yeah now we run dance classes every thursday night and it's for all abilities uh it's an lgbt class but we we it's basically for that and allies anyone that has that same ethos we're so lucky with the people that come through the door everyone's just so kind and up for it and just has a laugh and it's i mean thursday is my favorite time of the week i just love it it's great <laughs> oh i love that and i yeah. i used to work for three years i used to work in a, a wonderful care home for retired performers called denville hall david and All right. every every friday i'd we do a 10 minute um, timetable called the Friday, the Friday shuffle or the Friday boogie, <laughs> boogie with Ben, something like that. Nice. Um, and just as you said, David, the same with yeah. music. I work with a lot with dementia mm -hmm. residents. Yeah. Some beautiful, wonderful, honestly, wonderful place. Mm. But to see people just come alive for 10 minutes, just literally the Friday shuffle, that was it. And the literally they Aww. would just have a little shuffle. We'd have a little three, four person conga around the, you know, the, <laughs> the, the living areas. And people oh. just come to life, don't they? There's something yeah. beautiful about music and movement. And you mention, you know, the loneliness in the community. Is that, mm. that is awful, isn't it, in any walk of life? And it, isn't it wonderful yeah. how movement and music and any, any of the arts can kind of help, fee help make people feel included? Yeah. Um, for the LGBTQ plus community, loneliness is felt much more severely um as a generalization and people go through bouts of loneliness and detachment through different stages of their life but predominantly a, the sort of the older generation of the lgbtqa plus community really struggle with loneliness and um i mean that, the reason for that you could go on and on about what mm. um what the reasons for that is but when you're feeling uh when you have poor mental health when you have like anxiety feelings of loneliness feelings of wanting to i mean i i have it myself sometimes where mm. you just want to hibernate you want to just stay in depending on how severe that is or how long you that that period lasts for the harder it is to even move so people just want to stay on their sofa they just like even the thought of getting up to mm. make a cup of tea they don't want to do that so on the very like the very base level the more you detach yourself the more likely you are to not be physically uh, active and not want to partake in any kind of physical activity um, so obviously that leads to even more problems further down the line so this is why even though you, you, your body might be telling you, I don't want to do anything, I don't want to move, I don't want to leave the house, I don't want to see anyone. All you need to do is, to start off with, just go for a walk outside and, and move because your body actually will get so many endorphins and you'll mm. actually feel better, like 100% you'll feel better for doing that. And then from there, you can build and build and build. And I've had people that have come to the dance class that have only just come out they might be in their 30s 40s or whatever um and 
they have gone through this period of um, very poor mental health where they haven't felt been able to do anything. Um, one guy, it was his first ever um, experience with LGBTQ people. He'd, he'd come out to his wife and uh, children and obviously went through a period of poor mental health. And then this dance class was his first experience of LGBT people, bless him. <laughs> um, <laughs> and literally, because everyone's just hugging everyone at the door. Yeah, and like, yeah. You know, um, and he wasn't there to become the next Darcy Bustle. Like, he wasn't a dancer, but it doesn't matter. So he took what he wanted out of it. And you should have seen his face. He was just smiling from ear to ear the whole time. He just had he just had the best time. And, and so, yeah, I mean, you see it happen. You see people kind of heal themselves a little bit through movement and through just sort of the environment that we create which is which is why I love it so much yeah and David I think it's your personality and charm and drive that is a huge catalyst for that as well for a lot of people and I think what you say about those dark days and down Mm. days I've I've had them where Mm. like you say it takes every effort just to get out of bed to, despite a pretty decent career that I've had, to think, oh mm. gosh, what's happening with my career? To yeah. I, I can picture now family members like calling me and me not even having the energy to want to speak to people. Yeah. And definitely. it's bloody tough. And the part music and dance and movement, but even if you're not into that, just as, mm. like you say, a simple walk can help so yeah. much. And Definitely. I just think it's wonderful that you're helping people feel at ease who are new to the LGBTQ community mm-hmm. to, to feel themselves. And ultimately, yeah. and again, this is what I got from working at the, at the care home, David. Yeah. Life does come to an end at some point And I just want to see people happy. I want to make yeah. people happy because like you and working with the older community mm. you you see that it, it doesn't last forever does it so why not why not let's just spread some happiness yeah and of exactly. course life brings problems but i think the work you're doing with homo Par- parody is fantastic i really oh, do thank you so much yeah i I I mean, thinking about people in care homes and the elderly generation, it just always touches me because, Mm. yeah, I mean, our our community especially is quite ageist. And um, I guess there needs to be a change. There needs to be a switch in that narrative because, you know, people that are older, they're not, they're the same person that they were when they were in their, you know, teens, 20s. Like, I don't think anyone ever feels like they've grown up. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like well, you're I met always so that many person. characters and it yeah. inspired me, you know, the older generations still have so much to give and we can learn so much from them. Absolutely. Yeah. Is I that love something you spoke about in, in um when you spoke in Parliament, David? Is that an issue uh, that you're trying to raise awareness of right now? Yeah, so with the Mr. Gay England and then Great Britain, one of the things I really wanted to ask questions about was about uh the elderly and also the options for the LGBTQ plus community as they get older because um, at the time I was like where are the sort of gay care homes for example um, because there's so many people that would would benefit from that and having like-minded people around them you know um, so I just started doing a little little bit of research and there are some gay care homes in big cities like in uh i think there's one in brighton in london Mm. but they're so expensive like they're they're so elitist like you wouldn't be able to afford them unless you had a really big pension and you know a a lot of money that you could spend so yeah i just sort of started raising the questions about that had they ever thought about that you know and i've been, been lucky enough to go to parliament twice now and it's it's generally it's quite an informal thing where they're invited to come and speak to us some of them i think they literally just do it to get a picture with um a drag queen and a big old gay and then really? and it's like they've aligned with 
the, our whole community and then they can tick that box. Yeah. And if in general, people are like, oh, everything in Westminster is wrong, everything's bad, like all the MPs are this way, et cetera, et cetera. But when you actually go there and you meet a lot of them, it's really not like that at all. And there's some incredible MPs that are doing so much for our community and that have our backs 100% and that they take a lot of time out of their day for this kind of thing because when they're when all the MPs are invited it's entirely up to them whether they want to take it on or not uh I've had there's a few that have come every single year that are just really in our corner like Kate Osborne for example Mm. she's fantastic Emma Lewell Buck who sorts the day out for us that I could go on Jess Phillips there's a lot that actually really do care um and hopefully eventually that can make a difference Maybe one day I'll be Prime Minister and <laughs> we'll be loads of gay care homes. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be fantastic. Thank you. I mean, my uh, career as a performer, I did love it. I really did love it. Uh, but it got to a point where the knockbacks got harder and harder to take. And I, I got so many near misses. It's kind of like a tale as old as time, isn't it? Everyone has yeah. this kind of thing where it's like, oh, sixth final for that show and all this kind of thing and I, I think the the more I started choreographing the more I wanted to take control of my own fate a little bit and not be sort of like at the mercy of another panel and all that kind of thing it just it just sort of wore me down a little bit and I think maybe if I stuck to it there might have been a few more shows that I'd have got and I would have carried on but in all honesty the the career like the section of my career that I've had the most joy from is the the current one with homo parody. Um, We're not doing as big stages as I was doing when I was like touring with Miss Saigon, but it just feels uh, so rewarding to create something from scratch and to get the reaction that we get when we do our shows. It's just like, oh, it's honestly, it's so special. Um, And we always align with a charity. So there's that kind of element to the work that we do. So, uh, uh, like Terence Higgins Trust, London Friend, all these charities that are just so grateful for what we're doing, and we're great. We we want to do as much as we can for them. It just all feels right. I just love it. So the classes, David, are they mm. just London based, or is, is there a plan to spread that nationally? Do you think that that would work? Yeah, we've kind of we're we're talking about all this now, like how we can expand. I think. I really want to try out Manchester and see um, how we can sort of bring what we do up there. And yeah, I mean, as well, we're doing a lot of prides this year. And so when we're up there in the different prides, we're doing Birmingham and a few others. I want to be able to teach as well. I want to sort of bring that element to, to uh, to those events and see what happens from there. So yeah, it's all kind of, yeah, there's loads of plans and ideas and things that we think we might be able to do but it's just time like we want to make a new video at the minute but it's just like no one's free everyone's busy <laughs> <laughs> but do you find that certainly from my mental health busy is good mm. when I don't have a project when life's quiet then that's when my worries escalate and ferment you do so much and you help mm. so many people how do you how do you you relax can you relax um, it's funny you say that because I've I've felt that this year about the I, I've basically I quit my teaching job uh, my main teaching job and so I need because I needed more time I I literally was just here there and everywhere yeah. and it was it was all too much but since then having a bit more time has been I think the worst thing for me because you have all the like thinking time exactly yeah. like you said yeah and I just can't wait because we've got quite a busy period coming up I just can't wait for all of that to kick in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I, I, I'm a bit, I like being a busy person. I just like having all that stuff on, um, and to relax. I mean, I think when you're a performer and you're self-employed, it's really hard to switch off and relax. When I go for a walk, it should be to like fuel me for the day, Definitely. you know, but I'm constantly thinking, Oh, I wonder if, you know, my agent's emailed or I have a yeah. list to call for this, for that. And it's, it's very hard to get that balance, isn't it? It's so hard. It never ends. Just, um. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> David, you give, you give so much empathy to people. You make people feel very happy. 
are you proud of the work you achieve? You must be. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, I am. I am proud of the work I've done. I think with the Mr. Gay uh, Great Britain, it was really tough because you never feel like you've done enough. Uh, so there's always that thing in the back of your head saying like, oh, I should be doing more. You know, this was good, but not enough. Like I said. Um, so, yeah, there's kind of that. There was a lot of guilt that was attached with with all of that. Um, and yeah, there's. I guess with with homo parody as well I always think oh I could could do more but I've I've definitely allowed myself to sort of see the difference that things are things are making and yeah I I do feel proud of the work we're doing with homo parody and I just want to do more all the time I'm kind of like right next one let's do the next one and you know yeah I, I love it <laughs> yeah that's so evident David it is infectious and how how great that you know you made people happy you put smiles on people's faces as a performer as a dancer as a choreographer mm. putting smiles on the faces of the dancers you, you continue to work with mm. um but I generally think whatever walk of life you're in you'd put a smile on people's faces oh thank you yeah I mean i I think I've learned a lot from like the grief of losing both my parents that life is short and you know you you can't be happy all the time for sure like and if you were it would kind of be a little bit weird <laughs> um but you've just got to take the, the best of everything and make the most of everything that you're doing um like being present and like staying in the room as it were and and actually fully interacting with who's around you and really trying to get the most out of the c connections that you're making um, because you can meet loads of people and it can be very surface level you know just sort of like you know hi how are you yeah great yeah. and then you sort of move on but as soon as you start asking even like one question where they have to sort of think a bit further um, or even like remembering people's names people don't remember people's names yeah. and all that kind of thing as soon as you start making those connections you realize how much more it enriches the room and the people that you're you're around and then you'll remember their names and you'll remember that you know they might have talked about their sister or whatever and then that connection builds that's that's the only way I I feel like you can get through life is just to even when I'm in parliament or I'm in a sort of you know a swanky place where it's like a opening night or whatever if I can just make a few connections with people where it actually feels a bit genuine yeah then I, I can carry on with my day that's that's what I can get out of that you know because people will remember you won't they and you know mm. when I've been having low periods if somebody's you know again just asked like a second or third question mm. yeah you, you engage you have a moment you have an experience with somebody yeah absolutely I think it's really important What's the rest of the week looking like? Is it um, a busy one for you? Home well, and Parody Thursday? Yes, Home and Parody on Thursday. And then um, we've got a rehearsal with an unnamed drag queen. I can't mention who, oh, okay. but we're performing for a little little moment for UK versus the world finale. Oh, amazing. And the, which is very exciting, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. And then I'm dancing most of the weekend in clubs. <laughs> <laughs> oh god no easter <laughs> eggs for me <laughs> well i yeah. haven't apologized for my i think you choreographed me at the theater all bath and we did a pan it was beautiful yeah. piece i think so apologies yeah. for that my goodness <laughs> no need to apologize <laughs> oh that was so nice but is that a skill of a choreographer like you do you have to adapt your ideas and thoughts to people's capabilities definitely yeah um that was the hardest part of the job, I think, originally. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I guess that is a skill that I've learned. Yeah. Um, and if someone can't, can't dance, it's about kind of find. It's not about not being able to dance, but they don't feel comfortable dancing. It's about finding their sweet spot that they do feel comfortable with and then making it work, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but it's always good fun. I love it. when, <laughs> As long as people are like open-minded and just sort of like up for a laugh. Yeah, it's we'll talk about fun. open minded. I gave my first dame at Blackpool this year. I was widow twanky yeah. in Aladdin, and um, I loved seeing that. I, I was um, had a reveal in the in Twanky's laundrette, so I turned into mm. Beyonce, which was great. And then the start <laughs> of Act Two, I was Tina Turner. I was like, I'm amazed oh I didn't break my ankle, but I survived. But great fun. <laughs>
I wish I saw that. <laughs> so we're in Benji's Cafe. David, it's been great to see you. Oh. Congratulations on everything you achieve, the joy you continue to bring to people's lives. Thank you. And it's, it's just amazing to see your development as a person, as a human being from 2010 to everything you continue to achieve now. I, I think mm. it's wonderful. It's been lovely to chat. Um, yeah. What I'd like to ask you, we're in Benji's Cafe, I'd like to ask everybody this because I'm, I'm a real foodie and mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've got to watch the old waistline in my uh, <laughs> middle aged -dom. But what's on the dinner menu tonight? I mean, have you got time to cook dinner? What's, what's, what's on the yeah. menu tonight? I love cooking. It's like my therapy. Right. I just love cooking. Amazing. Um, tonight on the menu, I think it's going to be, I actually, I think I'm going to make a um, Thai green curry tonight Ooh. vegetable thai green curry yeah nice so that's that's the plan i lovely have like uh this isn't chicken because i'm kind of i'm like the worst vegan ever um because i used to say i'm vegan because i ate i had eggs and everything else was plant-based vegan i haven't heard that that's cool <laughs> i kind of made it up <laughs> it seemed to make sense but now i have fish as well so i'm honestly the worst i'm not a vegan like what is that <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah, but so yeah, I'll um I'll rustle up. I think it's gonna be like a this isn't chicken, uh, Thai green curry with rice. Oh, I like it. So no oh, yeah. no royal pizza from Prince Harry then. No no stuffed crust <laughs> no, pepperoni. No spicy pizza. <laughs> <laughs> David, it's great to see you. Um, oh, you too. Your smile's infectious. It's been lovely to have a chat. Thank you so much. And yeah, thank whenever you, you're up to, have a great day. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks, Bye. David. Bye. Thanks for joining me in Benji's Cafe. Hope you enjoyed listening to David and your coffee too. Make sure you hit follow so every episode gets sent straight to your phone. No booking required, available wherever you get your podcasts. In episode 5, I'll be chatting to actor and musician Tommy Sherlock. It's a brilliant story. I'll get the kettle. Have a great day. <laughs>